Hello! Today's video looks at London, as you know, by William Blake. Uh, it is a deeply angry and political poem. And so uh, I think you're going to need to hear it read out loud uh, so that you will hear that tone of anger and that enormous frustration at the, um, at the church, at the government and at the monarchy. So here we go. I wandered through each chartered street, near where the chartered Thames does flow, and mark in every face I meet, marks of weakness, marks of woe. In every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every ban, the mind-forged manacles I hear. How the chimney-sweepers cry, every blackening church appalls and the hapless soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls. But most through midnight streets I hear how the youthful harlot's curse blasts the newborn infant's tear and blights with plagues the marriage hearse. So hopefully you can hear just the violence of um, language reflecting the violence of his thought this is a revolutionary poem. I'm going to take you through the poem using this resource produced by a teacher called Simon Cox. Uh, the link is in the description below. Just pop down there and download this because it is perfect for your revision. So let's take a look at a little bit of context here to see how political this poem is. William Blake was a poet in Victorian and Georgian England. He wrote a selection of poems in his anthologies, uh, one called Songs of Innocence and the other called Songs of Experience. And you can see how they're gathered together um, in one collection here. This artwork is Blake's. He earned his living as an engraver. Um, and so these uh, paintings, if you like, were actually engravings. Um, that's how he earned his living. But his poetry... Uh, was a passion um, that he used to try and change people's political point of view. He wrote his poems for the masses, in other words, uh, in really simple language that everybody would understand, no matter their level of education. Uh, what we're told here is that most of the poems had a counterpart. So he'd write about a subject, let's say chimney sweepers, and he'd write a poem about um, their innocence, and then in the experience anthology, he'd write another poem about chimney sweepers showing how um, they were victims of a cruel society. So he looked at things from two perspectives. Well, what's interesting here is that London is one of the few poems where there isn't a counterpart. Uh, so London is a wholly critical um, poem, very, very political. Uh, and uh, that shows that uh, Blake doesn't think there is another point of view that he can look at. He only thinks that London is corrupt and needs to be changed. The poem is set during a time in England where there was poverty, child labour, which is symbolised by the chimney sweep, and a horrific war with France, which again is symbolised by the um, soldiers' blood down Paris walls. Well, what we need to know here is that uh, the war with France was with Napoleon and uh, the French had overthrown their monarchy. They'd had a successful revolution which overthrew all the nobles, the lords, the ladies, the dukes, the duchesses, the whole, um, the whole royal family and executed them. And Blake was actually in favour of this. He wanted um, to get rid of the monarchy in um, in England. Women had no rights. This is also really important to Blake. Uh, he actually um, educa educated his wife. When he married her, she couldn't even write, but he educated her, taught her to read and write, and um, in effect, she became his business partner. Um, so he's passionate about women's rights, which is very unusual for the day, um, and you'll see that reflected in um, the way he calls the marriage a hearse because his attitude to marriage is completely different uh, from the people of his day. Uh, 
death rates from disease and malnutrition are high, and the Industrial Revolution has resulted in many large oppressive factories, and it's these that are causing um, the landscape of London to blacken. These factories are belching out coal smoke and um, therefore causing um, real pollution, much greater pollution than we're used to now. Uh, Blake's poems often railed against these, so that means protested against them, and how London, arguably the greatest city in the world at that time, was dirty and corrupt, not just physically, but also in terms of uh, its politics and who controlled power, the monarchy, the government and the church. Well, let's see how we can make all that relevant to the actual poem. Uh, so the first thing you'll notice is this strange word, chartered, and it's a legal word uh, drawn up by lawyers where um, the rich began to buy up whole sections of London, but not just London, also the countryside. So they began to own even the natural Thames. Um, what they do is buy up the sides of the Thames and then charge businesses uh, for using them. Uh, so. Blake is protesting against how nature, which was free to every man, is suddenly being parceled up and sold off to the highest bidder. Uh, so the powerful become more powerful and the uh, lower classes become less powerful, now having to pay for things they never had to pay for before. Um, it's also a symbol of control and uh, we'll see how much... Um, Blake detests the idea that people have their minds and their lives controlled. Um, so nature is being controlled by powerful men, uh, which is symbolised in the river, um, but so are the streets in which we live. So he's also arguing we, Londoners, are also being controlled. We are also bought and sold, chartered. Uh, Blake is suggesting that everyone is without power. And that's done through the repetition of the word uh, every in this um, line here. And you'll see it carrying on elsewhere in the poem. And this repetition of every, this anaphora where it's repeated at the beginning of lines, um, is a real clue that uh, he thinks every ordinary man and woman is a victim. Uh, so they are without power and therefore miserable. Uh, the term mark can be a metaphor for a brand. So you need to understand what mark means here. Uh, and mark means notice here, and notice in every face I meet. But a mark is also a branding, such as you might put on a piece of livestock, like a cow. So you've all seen that done in cowboy films, no doubt. Uh, and this is how farmers identified um, their own livestock. Well, here, uh, the marks of weakness are what you can see in people's faces. Uh, what Blake sees as he wanders around the streets, not just uh, images of weakness, but he's also suggesting that these are marks of ownership. So the rich people of London own the citizens of London by keeping them weak and by keeping them miserable. And the alliteration on weakness and woe emphasises that misery. The repetition, which you remember I called anaphora, of in every, is also used to show the scale of suffering. You know, it's here, and it's here, and it's here. It affects every man, every infant, every voice. Uh, the alliteration of mind forged manacles, mind and manacles there, helps draw our attention to the metaphor. And don't forget to um, name the techniques when you talk about them. Blake is showing that these people are not physically held back, but their belief in their own weakness holds them back. So this is quite an interesting um, point. Um, if you um, think about money, um, money is an illusion. You know, I give you a £5 note, which is just a piece of paper, but you think it's worth £5. I give you a slightly bigger one, and it's worth £20. And this is what I mean by this being a revolutionary poem. If we all stop believing in the value of paper money, then um, we would get real things for what we offered. We'd 
trade services with each other. And it's the same idea here. Um, the law only allows the rich to start owning this property because we all enter into this agreement. We all um, go along with it. And the same with the Thames. If everybody in London decided to um, use the Thames as they wished, moor the boats where they wished and didn't pay the so-called owners of this land, then we'd have a revolution against the rich. And that's really what uh, Blake is calling for. So the mind forged manacles are an attack on the thinking of Londoners. So Blake is um, accusing Londoners of giving in, of being complicit with their rulers. And he's trying to get them to see that um, what they're doing is only bringing them mo woe, misery. It's a sign of weakness. Um, they're all afraid. And actually, what they should do is change their lives. Next, Blake uh, juxtaposes uh, the chimney sweeper's cry with the church. And notice the alliteration there as well. So the church is condoning child labour here. Ch ch uh, children go up chimneys. They obviously suffer tremendous respiratory problems breathing in um, coal dust. Uh, and die very young if they're not relieved of those duties. Um, and the church should be stopping this exploitation and doesn't. So the church is a real subject that um, Blake wants to attack here. Uh, so let's see what the note says. Uh, the church bells which ring out is striking. Uh, so those bells are contrasted with the chimney sweeper's cry. Um, Blake saw religion as a tool to keep the people down, in other words, to oppress them. Um, so the reason that religion will oppress you is Christianity allows you to accept a terrible life now because it invites you to believe that there is an afterlife, a heaven in which you will be rewarded. Um, whereas the revolutionary says, no, let's change life here and now. Let's make a better world here. And, of course, Blake here is a revolutionary, which is why he's, he's attacking the church here as being complicit, as being um, responsible um, for lots of the evils in society, like the exploitation of children. Uh, then we have blackening here, a literal description of what's happening to the walls of the church, because um, it's the coal dust around London that's doing it. Um, appalls is um, a pun here so a, it means to shock it, it shocks the church to see um, what's happening to the children even though they don't do anything about it but a pall is also a covering that you put over a coffin um, it's a black um, drape or um, linen and Blake is suggesting that the church is like this black drape that is causing the death of London the church is literally spreading this over the dead body of London. It's killing it. So that again is a metaphor. Now we look at the soldier's sigh. This draws on the link to war at the time, which I mentioned with Napoleon. The blood running down the palace walls signifies their sacrifice to protect the power of those who live in the palaces. So he is um, attacking the power of the soldiers being used against the people. So the soldiers are defending um, the rulers, uh, which is the opposite of what happened in France. There the soldiers uh, got rid of the monarchy. Uh, hapless suggests that the soldiers are stupid. Um, but another way of um, interpreting that is also uh, suggesting that they're unfortunate. Uh, so another way of looking at this line is to suggest that the soldiers will be killed when the revolution comes. Um, so it's also a rallying cry to get soldiers to change their mind and side with the people. Um, so they will avoid their own blood running down the palace walls. Uh, but of course, this is also a symbolic metaphor where Blake wants to see the blood of the uh, aristocracy. The king, the queen, um, the princes, the whole lot also um, shot and executed. He wants to get rid of of the monarchy. Now we come to the final stanza. 
Harlots is slang for prostitutes. Well, it's not really slang. It's quite um, it's quite a formal use of um, uh, a language at the time. Um, Blake is corrupting the idea of childbirth with sexual exploitation. Um, the newborn infant is born into a broken world, which is why he's um, got a tear. Well, I think we can go a little bit deeper than that, though. Um, the youthful harlot is um, no more than a child. That's why she's youthful. Uh, so again, this is a form of child exploitation. Uh, the poor are kept poor, and many young women unable to get jobs because they're not as equal as men or getting jobs that pay anything like a living wage, have to turn to prostitution in order to earn a living. Um, so they are cursed, and in turn they curse the society that has made them victims. Uh, Blake, of course, curses them, because he's actually attacking men here, who are using um, children for sex, without any conscience about it. And again, the church isn't doing anything about it, the monarchy, the palace isn't doing anything about it. And, of course, the government isn't doing anything about it. Uh, the curse blasts the newborn infant's tear um, and blights with plague, plagues rather the marriage hearse. This is the hypocrisy of his society. Um, prostitution really only exists because married men uh, pay for sex outside marriage. Um, and we've also got the suggestion here that Blake is suggesting that marriage is a hearse, um, leading people towards a spiritual death, because men and women are not equal. Um, men simply exploit women. Uh, now, if we go in a little bit deeper again, the curse and the plagues could easily be a reference to um, sexually transmitted diseases. So the husband contracts this disease through unprotected sex with a prostitute, because, of course, um, you know, the modern um, uh, condoms didn't exist in those times. And then they would bring that disease back into their own marriage, uh, which would then, of course, destroy the marriage, turn it into a hearse. Uh, but, of course, this would also affect the, um, the infant who becomes um, infected uh, and possibly disabled. And if we just accept this as being... Um, any child born into a marriage, um, Blake is now arguing that the future being created by um, this political state in London, where people are kept in poverty and kept in oppression, um, is blighting the future, um, damaging the future. So the future generations are all damaged by the behaviour of the current generation, carving up London for profit and oppressing um, everybody else who lives there. So another way of um, talking about this is to describe the marriage hearse as an oxymoron which juxtaposes the joy of marriage with the misery of death. Uh, Blake is suggesting that society has destroyed all the good things in life um, which marriage should be. Okay, let's look at how else you should write about this poem. Uh, note that its structure is written in four stanzas with a regular alternate rhyme scheme. Um, this is important. It's quite childlike, um, and that's to do with Blake's purpose. He wants this to be memorable because he wants it to be revolutionary. He wants people to be able to quote it in their bars or in their coffee houses or at home. And uh, to memorise this poem, he wants it to make a difference. Um, this is an interesting idea. It may reflect the regular walking pace of the narrator as he walks around London. Um, personally, I don't think it does, but you can get a mark for saying it. It's much better if you relate it instead, though, to his purpose uh, as a revolutionary, as someone who's trying to change the world. The last line in each stanza tends to deliver a powerful statement which sums up the rest of the stanza. Again, that's really important if you want people to be able to quote it. It's the last lines that are going to carry the meaning. Uh, stanza 1 focuses on misery. Stanza 2 on people's refusal to stand tall, in other words, to throw off the oppressor. Stanza 3 about the way people are sacrificed for the rich and powerful. And stanza 4, how all the poverty is corrupting everything good about family and life. 
Um, we've covered that, haven't we? This bit is particularly useful. It shows you the kind of statement you can write that will earn you marks. So instead of the poem is about the misery of life in London, you would say the poem is an ironic look at misery in the greatest city in the world. So Blake is juxtaposing the magnificence of London with the poverty of its inhabitants. The poet is upset at the loss of joy and innocence. Well, that's true, but can we make it better? Blake's views are revolutionary for the time, challenging the idea that man is worth more than slavery um, and therefore suggesting that men are, in fact, enslaved by their beliefs and their willingness to allow their rulers to oppress them. Uh, people in power are living on the pain of others. This becomes Blake challenges the establishment. That means the monarchy and the government and the church, everyone who holds um, power in their palaces and churches, which are marked by the blood and blackening of good people. Um, so hopefully you can see uh, how that will work to help you write more sophisticated answers. Students often ask, uh, well, how, how can I compare this to another poem? What's the, what's the very best poem to compare it to? Um, well, I want to show you that actually you can compare it to any poem. So if we look at Ozymandias, uh, Shelley writes this poem in order to attack the establishment, to attack uh, tyrannical dictators, to attack uh, rulers who um, oppress their people, which you can see in the description of Ozymandias. And that's exactly the same intention as Blake. He's attacking um, these rulers. But the difference, of course, is that Blake is saying uh, people themselves have the power to change this. They don't have to wait for time and history to do it for them. If we compare it to the prelude, we can show how Wordsworth in this poem is um, attacking conventional Christianity and saying that actually pantheism, this idea that God is in everything, particularly in nature, is um, a, a more powerful truth. And we can easily look at um, the attack on um, this chartered idea of how um, rulers are carving up nature and exploiting it for their own gain, ruining children through the chimney sweep, uh, young women through prostitution, all this is an attack on nature and on God. Um, so that would link, if you like, to Wordsworth's poem. Uh, the significant difference here, perhaps, being that um, Wordsworth turns his back on London. He's no longer fighting for it. Uh, he's actually chosen to uh, write instead about more inspiring landscapes like the Lake District, whereas Blake is desperate to reclaim London and make it once again that most important environment. To compare it to My Last Duchess, we'd look at how this is also a political poem. Browning is attacking uh, the abuse of power and also showing how the powerful feel that they are um, impervious to law. They're completely above the law. He has, in fact, murdered and gotten away with it. And that's exactly what's happening in um, London. And the uh, other obvious parallel here is the treatment of women um, exploited by a patriarchy, uh, which you hopefully know means a uh, society controlled by men, by males. A comparison with Charge of the Light Brigade would look at uh, the complete contrast in politics. So Tennyson is um, very much in support of the establishment. Um, he's quite happy um, to see blood run down palace walls, um, at least English blood being shed on the uh, battlefield. He sees it as glorious and honourable and not something to be disgusted at. Um, but the similarities in the poem are the um, significant use of um, anaphora and repetition, which is exactly the same technique that Blake relies on so heavily in London. Um, and you also have a similar rhyming uh, pattern as well. Um, so uh, poets that use very much the same techniques, but for opposite purposes. With um, exposure, you'd uh, concentrate on the fates of the characters within it. Um, the marks of woe that Blake mentions in uh, Londoners are evident in all the men um, 
who are fighting this battle. Uh, the difference, of course, is this is an entirely male world, um, a brotherhood uh, protesting. Here, Wilfred Owen is again protesting. It's, it's also a political poem where he wants to change the course of the war by persuading what he sees as an indifferent and ill-informed public um, that the war is inhuman and indeed the very conditions they're kept in, never mind the uh, battles themselves, just the conditions they're kept in inevitably result in uh, hundreds or thousands of deaths. A comparison with Storm on the Island might look at the sense of place. Uh, so London is described in uh, some detail, but the detail is metaphorical. Uh, and similarly, the detail of the Storm of the Island is also all metaphorical. So it exists to describe the island as a real place, but also as a metaphor for um, the political troubles in Ireland itself. Um, so hopefully you've studied Stormont, um, the uh, uh, political alliance between uh, Catholic and Protestant, um, nationalist and unionist in Northern Ireland. And uh, we're looking then at... Uh, Again, revolution, isn't it? That was that was the job of the IRA to upset the status quo, uh, to get rid of what they saw as uh, British imperialism, um, and it's that very thing, that fight against power, that um, Blake wants to incite in his poem. Um, so again, really easy to compare, as long as you know the poems well enough. Bayonet Charge might seem a harder poem to compare because it's so clearly rooted in a single moment uh, of the First World War. But actually, this also is a political poem. It's very much an anti-war poem. And uh, it takes the view that war destroys uh, not just human dignity, but any sense of civility and civilization. Uh, king, honor, human dignity, etc., are dropped like luxuries in a yelling alarm. Um, and interestingly, we might argue that uh, London is a warning about um, a general public turning on its masters like this. Um, but it's a warning that Blake expects um, those in charge, um, the church, the government, uh, the nobility, to ignore and uh, he therefore imagines a, a populace rising up um, in opposition and I guess the similarity here is that that opposition never comes that revolution never happens and so the working class man is still being exploited by those in power and sent to their inevitable deaths remains is perhaps a much easier war poem to um, uh, to link to London, because this is the very definition of the mind-forged manacles, uh, although in this case it's the act of barbarity carried out by the um, protagonist and narrator, who is now haunted um, by what they've done. Um, the manacles here are a conscience, and uh, what's interesting is the contrast here, had that conscience been um, uh, much, much stronger, uh, then he would not have assassinated this looter. Um, and therefore, the mindforged manacles there would have been a protection um, against uh, misery, marks of misery and marks of woe. Um, uh, so that's an inversion of the way that uh, mindforged manacles are used in the Blake poem. Here, Armitage is perhaps more optimistic suggesting that um, human nature will always um, find a way to look for um, good and restore justice, whereas uh, that's the thing that Blake is complaining, human nature is accepting. It accepts um, authority and refuses to rebel against it, or at least the English human nature does. And it's the, uh, the Londoner, the Englishman, who he wants to be, uh, start rebelling against uh, the monarchy. Now to compare it with poppies we'd need to focus on the theme of loss 
so in London we've got this contrast between what London uh, should be like and perhaps used to be like um, the free Thames compared to what it's like now um, the youth which has been corrupted by um, uh, prostitution uh, the church which was once um, holy and Christian which has now become corrupt and uh, in league with um, authority and power and so on uh, whereas here the sense of loss is much more personal um, it's about uh, obviously a son uh, we could argue it's about all sons and this represents all mothers losing their son uh, we can see the whole poem as an extended metaphor it may be that this um, woman's son never actually went to war it's just a metaphor for uh, losing your children, your sons really. Um, whereas in Blake's poem, it's the loss of what London represents, um, a much uh, wider subject in some ways, but less wide in others because, you know, every mother in the world who has a son um, has to um, say goodbye and let them free out into the world, um, whatever that future may bring. However, this is clearly a deeply personal response to that loss, uh, whereas London is a political response and a call to action. War photographer is a very close parallel to London. Again, it is a political poem. This time it is anti-war. But like Blake, uh, Duffy is upset with a population, our own population. She attacks the readers of the Sunday supplements who uh, bring a kind of fake emotion to the coverage of war and don't bring a proper response and try to stop it. She too is after revolutionary thought, revolutionary acts where uh, people go out on marches and campaign um, to stop wars being fought in their name um, or indeed the name of other countries. Um, and that's exactly the same passion and urge for political revolt that uh, William Blake is using in London. Uh, Tissue is uh, the problematic poem in the anthology and I've yet to make a video about this one. Uh, before I um, start comparing it to anything I think we'll just skip over it and my advice at the minute is whatever you do don't write about Tissue until you fully understand it. It is actually a very um, challenging poem because it's not altogether clear what it's about. Uh, look out for that video when I make it. Uh, hopefully it will be really useful. Uh, emigre. Uh, the emigre is a very natural comparison. Uh, again, it's about someone who has been um, ostracised from the city they love, here through the result of, um, of revolution, the very thing that Blake is campaigning for. Um, Blake has lost his London because um, the ruling classes have uh, basically been able to exploit it and monopolise it. Um, uh, and the same has happened to the uh, country of the emigre's birth. It's a city that exists only in her mind now um, and can never be recovered. Even if she went back to it, it's irrevocably changed from what it was before. Uh, so again, you've got this... Um, terrible sense of loss. Uh, if this is a political poem then it's uh, asking for acceptance really uh, for the new country, Britain presumably, um, to accept her um, and recognise the trauma of what she's lost, what she's been through. Um, a different political point from Blake's and uh, you would contrast the overwhelming tone of this which is probably um, sorrow, nostalgia, regret uh, with Blake's which is impassioned anger and uh, political rhetoric. Checking out my history is also a deeply political poem. It's uh, campaigning for uh, a wider white society uh, to change its view of black society within the same country. Um, it's also a, a call to arms uh, from John Agar to other black people to recognise their own history and, if you like, have a revolution of thought um, in the way that they view themselves. And this is really similar, isn't it, to the way that uh, Blake 
wants uh, Londoners to see themselves in a particular way, to recognise their own misfortune and rise up against it. Um, stylistically, also makes great use of repetition and anaphora as Blake does. Uh, this poem is about uh, the outsider, uh, kamikaze pilot who re refuses to kill himself and therefore acts outside of the um, rules of his own culture. And in many ways we can see Blake as that same rebellious figure, um, a voice which is not popular, um, campaigning against the monarchy, against government, against the church, you know, very much an outside political voice. Um, many of Blake's political views uh, were inflammatory and uh, publishers often wouldn't publish his work. He had to end up publishing it himself uh, because it was considered politically dangerous. So here we would make a comparison between Blake himself, the poet, with the protagonist of this poem. So in this part of the video, I've tried to convince you of three things. One, download this excellent revision resource from Mr. Simon Cox. Uh, two, uh, that any of the poems can be compared to each other. And three, that the way to compare them is to look at the poet's purpose. That always gives you a way in. In my next video, I'll focus on this section, uh, theme, structure and revision, uh, and how to use the structure of the poems and the themes of the poems again to make comparisons. Well, good luck in your revision. If you'd like more, don't forget to subscribe. See you soon.